Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, <laughs> another day. I, I said yesterday, every day is Sunday. Every time I, I start one of these things, I'm trying to work out what day it is and, and where I am. But um, we're on uh, Lockdown 21 Photography Sessions. Um, today, we have got a fantastic speaker. Um, I, I've, I've, been, I've been stalking him a little bit for the last couple of years, um, yeah. just because I, I, love, uh, I love sailing, not that I'm a sailor, but I love the pictures and, and, and the, the vibe that, that I get from, uh, from looking at, uh, you know, a, a beautifully stained teak deck <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, squalls and sails, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know my J class from my Maxi, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, Anna van der Waal will give us, uh, you know, the whole rundown of, of, of everything um, sailing related with, when it uh, comes to photography. Um, I, I'm extremely honored to have, uh, to have him on, um, on our live stream today. He is a Canon Explorer of Light, um, uh, which is, you know, from, from Canon's point of view, is the top uh, photographers that, uh, that they have, uh, you know, shooting for them. Um, but I'm, I'm talking too much already. Anna van der Waal, it's all over to you. Have a good one. Great. Thank you, Quentin. Um, I'll just start off. Um, I'll just get the, the, the screen, the starting screen going here. Um, Quentin, thank you for inviting me to speak to your group today. And uh, it's so great to be connected with a South African group of photographers. And I've looked at a bunch of the shows that you've put on and the quality is amazing. Um, I left South Africa in 1979 to go sailing and racing professionally overseas and ended up in the United States and started my, my business um, in Rhode Island. And for those of you that are not, not totally familiar with the layout of New England or the East Coast, um, for this is home for me. I'm just south of Providence, or here's Boston, so I'm an hour and a half south of Boston, and I'm about three and a half, sort of almost due east of New York City, and then here's Washington, D.C., and then, of course, the rest of the place goes on. So we're in the middle of busy New England, and this is the epicenter of sailing in the world, and um, just a, a wonderful place to operate and work out of. Um, Without much further ado, I'm going to go on with my show. Um, Canon made a very nice little film about me a few years ago, and I was busy filming the America's Cup. And so um, all the footage in this little film, it's only about two or three minutes long, uh, is all shot by me, the video in 4K and some stills. And so let's hope that you guys can all follow along uh, with a nice, fast stream. So here we go. Click and start. Photography on the water is all about capturing the excitement of the moment. Be in front of them, that they come right past us. The harder it blows, the wetter it gets, the bumpier it is, the harder it is to get the shot. You know, sailing can be dangerous. People see themselves floating through the ocean with a pina colada and a palm tree in the background. But there are some hardcore racing out there. Probably blowing 20 to 30 knots here. The rig comes down, the sail blows out, somebody pulls over the side. It's very exciting out there. We've got to catch that. I love shooting tight, 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 where all you see in the frame is boats and people and a little sail. Yeah, good. Excellent. The, the image has got to look perfect. The color's got to be right. This is like a dance out here. What we're seeing video nowadays is more like a craft of filmmaking. It's beautiful colors. I find what we're doing with the DSLRs, the color and the look of the moving image is beautiful. The tools that I have now on the water with my EOS 1DX or whatever I'm using, a 5D Mark III, it's the tools that enables me to do my job. The versatility of this lens for doing this kind of work is just bloody perfect, you know? I think protection of the gear is obviously paramount, but what the point of having a piece of gear so protected you can't get to it to shoot with it? And Lopro has really nailed that. Snap that baby closed, let's keep the water up. The dry zone bags have been great. I've used them a lot. Obviously, I work on the water, near the water, in the water. It's constant. All the time, I've got to be careful that the, the gear doesn't get swamped. In the days of film, we would have 36 frames, and then you'd have to go down below and change your roll of film, and you'd expose 
the back of the camera to waves. And now we have these great, fast Lexar cards with the capability of accepting thousands of images. I mean, what a luxury. You just keep firing away. Oh, this is beautiful here. I just pop the four cards into the reader and it automatically downloads them all. Boom, boom, boom. It's super fast. It's controlled. And I know which cards have been downloaded. I mean, how simple is that? There's a lot of excitement out there. And when everything comes together, you get that magic shot where you've got the crew member just grinding away or teeth clenched because it's cold, he's wet. There's a wave to come over the sailboat and we capture the moment. This is the excitement of sailboat photography. Well, there you go. That was amazing. I started, yeah, thank you. Very yeah, that cool. was fun putting that together. And that was during the practice racing of the America's Cup in San Francisco. Uh, so we were lucky we could get close and, and we had a nice team of shooters and all that stuff there. Um, like I said, I left South Africa in 79 to go sailing. Um, I did the Cape to Re Uruguay race and then got back to Cape Town and realized I loved it and, and wanted to do more. I flew to England, did the Fastnet race. I did Cows Week, did a whole bunch of um, sailing in Europe and racing all on a sort of professional basis. And in the meantime, always just had a camera tucked away, took a couple pictures here and there. And my camera of choice was an Olympus OM-1, a small little compact camera. I really only had one lens of 50. And uh, little by little, I got more gear. But I, um, I eventually got a ride on a, a Whitbread boat. So this was in 1981. And I got to sail on the Dutch boat Flyer. And uh, to, you know, we did some sail trials. We sailed to Marblehead, Massachusetts to do before the race started and we were at anchor there. And uh, I'd been taking some pictures again here and there and shooting with slide film. And um, we were at anchor and I hear this uh, knock on the hull and I look over the side and there's four guys in suits in a little rowing boat. I'm like, geez, what are you guys doing in a rowing boat with suits on? Well, we're actually the, uh, the editor and the publisher of Sail Magazine. Can we look at your boat? Now, this boat that I was sailing on was a pretty well-known boat and, uh, you know, preparing for the Whitbread Round the World Race. And I showed them around and they loved the boat. And I said, can you look at some of my pictures? And this guy, Keith Taylor, the editor, took one look at my slides, which was in a, in a sleeve. And he held it up to the light and he says, damn, this is nice stuff. You want to shoot for us? So that's, that's how I started shooting in the Round the World Race. And it sort of carried on from there. I mean, th these are my wheels on the water. You know, some guys use a helicopter, some guys use a plane, and I use mostly a chase boat. So I have this 20-foot duck or rib, as we call them here in the United States. And um, I had my boy working with me at the time, but he was lying on deck sleeping. You know, these were these bloody teenagers. you got to dawn them to get them in shape and <laughs> them work for you. So there I was driving and, and shooting my, uh, by myself. I'm a huge fan of the, the Jet Ranger. Uh, and of course, now a lot of us are using the R44, the Robinson to work in as well. Um, but I do a lot of aerial work and it's, it's a wonderful tool and it's absolutely the perfect tripod. You know, it's up and down, left and right, hover, go backwards and just, it's dry, it's not bumpy. It's just for me working on the water, it's the perfect tool. It can be blowing 30 knots or whatever and shitty out and yet I'm dry in my little perch up in the sky. Um, I jump in the water from time to time. I have a very nice Aquatec waterproof housing. I put a 5D Mark IV in the housing and I jump in. I'm a strong swimmer. I used to swim a lot at, in Cape Town at, at the Newlands swimming pool. I swam for a swim team. So I'm comfortable in the water and I can get pretty close to the action when I'm in the water. Um, drone, we've been doing a lot of drone, but my young boy on the left is my chief pilot. And you know, these kids are so damn good from playing video games. So you give them a controller and say, do this there, bingo. And I'm just shitting myself all the time that the thing's going to crash in the tide. Um, this gives you a little idea of the look of the drone as it's a few feet above the deck. And young Adrian, or his nickname is Yap. The Americans laugh at that name. They have no idea where that comes, comes from, my South African roots. Um, but he does a good job. So this is a little bird's eye view of the boat show. Uh, where he was uh, shooting for me and we're obviously in my little boat floating around. This is a shot of a ship leaving Narragansett Bay, which is the main uh, piece of water connecting Newport to the ocean and with a 500 millimeter lens, got the pilot boat under the bow of the ship. 
Um, I've also done a bunch of ship, actual big ship work. It's not only sailboats and pleasure craft, but here um, shooting with a 15 millimeter that, that, that fisheye lens that Canon makes, uh, just to show the, how big the ropes are and give it some perspective. And um, this is all commercial work. So, you know, a shipping company will call me up and say, um, I want you to, to shoot for our annual report or for brochure or for social media. And I'd go on board and, and photograph, you know, the guys loading and unloading and, and just handling the ship. And I just love that kind of work. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This gives you an example of the type of work that I was doing. So this is a Dutch company, Dockwise, and they come through Cape Town regularly. Uh, going around uh, the Cape of Good Hope because they're too big for the Suez or the Panama Canal. And here's a, an oil rig that needs to be moved from the Gulf back to the United States. And, and I said to the guy, so, uh, you know, we were talking about my rates and these Dutch are so tight, you know, and they're like, oh, heel erg dude, dat is veel te veel geld, you know, my rate. And I said, well, what do you charge for moving a, an oil rig like that? He said, oh, 15 million euros or dollars, you know, and I was like, well, you don't have a couple of bucks in that budget to shoot your pay for your lowly photographer. But in any case, we've had a fantastic rapport and this gives you an idea here. I'm on board and, and this gives you an idea of the scale. This is a worker standing on one of the floats. So this is a floating, what they call a semi-submersible oil rig. The same company moves sailboats around the world. And this is leaving Narragansett Bay. So here is Newport on the left-hand side. And these guys will pick up a whole load of sailboats. So the ship sinks down and then the sailboats get moved on board and then they move off. So in the fall, or let's say in, you know, in the autumn, they'll pick up a whole load that's leaving New England to head for the Caribbean. And I was there with my little Robinson. You can see the side of the R22 here, shooting again with that 15 millimeter fisheye. So one, once we get to the destination, I jump in the water with my Aquatech housing and just show an over and under. And it's such a nice tool to show what you're doing. And it took me a little while to figure out how to sort of get these shots um, so I end up setting the f-stop at about f-16. I pre-focus at about a meter and switch the autofocus off. And then I go to a fairly high ISO of about maybe a thousand. That's why I've got good shutter speed, good depth of field, and I can just bang away, fire away, and not worry about the thing hunting and not getting focus. Yeah, it's a very effective way of, of shooting, you know, marine-related photography. Here's a nice aerial shoot. I do a lot of work for these sort of small to medium sized power boats. And this is all helicopter work. Nice late light, as you can see, the sun's going down. Slow shutter speed of about maybe a 15th or a 20th handheld. So I'm using a 5D Mark IV or 1DX with a 16 to 35. And I just set that thing at a sort of, you know, like I said, F16 or F11. And I love the, show, the, the slow shutter speed and it really just gives you nice a nice blurry effect, you know. You and Justin can uh, can swap roles. Huh? You both use yeah. uh, chase uh, chase planes or chase boats. Yeah, that's it. And it's 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 a very important part of my my life having the right chase boat driver who really listens and knows where we got to go. Because when I'm looking the one way, I got to make sure I'm not getting run down by another sailboat behind me. So the chase boat driver is the eyes in the back of my head. And uh, so, yeah, and then the pilot, of course, is also a really important guy in the helicopter. Um, here's another shot that I, I worked on a couple of times. You know, every time you get an opportunity, you push it a little further. I put the tripod on the back platform on this boat and then used a, it was the um, 12 to 24 millimeter Canon lens and did a fairly long exposure of probably two or three seconds at F-16. And this was in Manhattan. Uh, actually, this is in Miami on the Miami River. And then I had the guy turn the boat from left to right so that all the lights of the building has got nice colorful streaks in it. This is one of the navigation lights, no filter used. And then there's still a little color left in the sky. So that was cool to, um, you know, show what's going on. And ah, the client was psyched. It was fun. Now that was sort of two or three different assignments getting to this point where it really worked. Um, Details, showing the fine details of the craftsmanship of the boat. The boat builders love that. And again, here with a 70 to 200 Canon F2.8 and shooting it wide open. And of course, here's my, this is my focal point. And uh, just sort of nice light, um, beautiful woodwork, good craftsmanship. I do a lot of interiors. 
again, a tripod, a 16 to 35 at f11, and an ISO of about 200 and a shutter speed of maybe a half a second or a second. So I can do long shutter speed. It doesn't matter. There's nothing really moving there. So it's um, more of a matter of getting the, the light nicely balanced. And a lot of these bigger boats have really nice lighting. So I don't have to put a lot of extra light in there. This is how um, these, these people slum it, poor guys. They have a terrible place to sleep in their big multi-million dollar yachts. So this is the master cabin, um, a, a great spot to hang out, obviously. But for me, the lighting was the, the challenge here. Sometimes I use a little bit of daylight. Sometimes I'll block the daylight out. Sometimes I'll put lights in behind me to light it all up. Um, and again, the 16, that 16 to 35 I use for all my interior work. And then it's to doing the outside work location work and I either shoot late in the day or early in the morning and people are always saying well we've got you for the whole day what are we going to do at midday I said we're going to go and have a dop and have lunch and have a sleep and at four o'clock we start again and that's sort of and once they get the hang of things that that's how it works because to shoot in the middle of the day is an absolute waste of time it's all the lights blown out and, well you'd never you'd you know, never get those beautiful lights at the middle of the day that's for sure no no so this was shot down in, in Miami on Biscayne Bay, and this is a builder from Maine. And um, we always shot everything up in Maine, which is, it's a beautiful area, lots of pine trees and big granite boulders. But I said, let's go do a little shooting in Florida. So this was late, you know, this is in February, so it's winter light, beautifully soft. And again, probably shot with about a 300 millimeter. I have that 300 um, 28, that prime lens of Canon's, which is absolutely a beautiful piece of glass. Um, same boat, same assignment, a little earlier in the day, time to experiment. So I ended up putting this, the, uh, the 14, that 28 prime rectilinear Canon lens in the housing and then leaning over the little duck, over the rib, over the side, we were following them along. And the guy in the, on the orange is, is the client and he's screaming at me, what the hell are you doing? That's not going to work. That's going to look like shit. I said, stand by commander. And, um, any case, I showed him the pictures later on. It's like, whoa, that really worked out nicely. So fun to experiment and think outside the box a little bit. Um, just to explain a little bit how the Canon Explorers of Light program works, there's 35 photographers in the United States who are picked from obviously many people who would love to be part of the program. And each photographer has a certain field that they specialize in. So there's football, there's um, you know, basketball, there's wedding photography, there's this aeronautical, there's motorbikes, and I do the boating. Um, so I'm very fortunate. I've been part of that exclusive club for 12 years. And it's, it's wonderful because we end up, you know, shooting for them. They use our pictures for PR, for brochures. We test new gear. We talk about things we'd like to see. It's just a, a wonderful, and I'm very fortunate to be part of that, that whole gang of the Explorers gang. Um, I, I wanted to show you a couple more little films. And this one is one that I made for those of you that are interested, I used a Canon XF305, and that's now been replaced by the X, XF705, which is a, a, a camcorder, but of, of some good stature that shoots beautifully. And um, I wanted to, I love fishing. I grew up in Hout Bay and, and always had a, a sweet spot for these guys and always went out fishing. And this time I thought, I'm gonna tell a story about how these fishermen of New England do their thing. So here is um, a little film about fishing in, in New England. It started out as a summer job, really. My father was a fisherman, my grandfather. Actually, both sides, um, um, my mom's side too, there was one. I started mending nets, and um, they were shorthanded one day, so I jumped on the boat. On the way out to the net, it's actually uh, kind of a bonding moment for me to crew in the morning. You know, it's the first thing the day hasn't actually started yet, so that is actually a time for sort of storytelling amongst the crew and um, sort of quiet time before we actually get to the track and jump on the boat. And, you know, we catch up, and laugh about stories, and stupid stuff that happened the day before. Every spring we kind of have an idea that we're going to get this, this scup run. So we had the same people that um, probably were around when my grandfather um, was fishing. 
it's, it's, it's definitely a team effort and we're out there, everybody has to work together because one little mess up, it can just drive the fish down and put the net where that brings. When you see the boil of fish, you, I mean, you get excited from the first time you put your hands into the net and you just see that little boil. We're bringing up the bottom of the net and that's what's rising to the surface. They are just trying to find a way out. You know, you're stepping on the net, you're bringing fish up, you're stepping on it. Vincent, if I talk over this, you can hear me, right? Back out because the, the weight of the yeah, fish. yes we can. So I used um, a GoPro yeah, in the shot here on a pole and stuck it in the net to be able to see what was going on underwater. Because if you let the corner down, they swim, they get behind and see the boat. So this, you have to get that corner up and there could be 100,000 pounds of fish pushing into that corner and you just want to keep that wall of, of twine up so they, they can't get by. This is a very old technique of fishing. So that gave you a little idea of, of um, fishing in New England and storytelling. And I love doing a video. It's such a cool medium to tell a story because you have the audio, you know, with stills, like, as you can see in this shot, yeah, it's nice, but there's nothing like the creak and groan of the block of a sail or a wave of, of birds screaming. So I've done a bunch of video and still really enjoy storytelling with that, but it's a lot more complex than stills because you need a script writer, you need an editor, you need assistance, you need, yeah, it's a whole, it quadruples the whole production of a still shoot. So now we jump to the Bahamas and here uh, are the locals sailing their boat. They build these boats, they make their own sails and it's just an amazing scene to photograph in Georgetown, which is in the Exum so the Bahamas are obviously just a short skip off the Florida East Coast. And here we were lucky, it was late in the day, sort of four o'clock and then we're still racing and with a 500 millimeter lens, uh, this is that F4 uh, LIS uh, lens and just really wanted to catch that guy at the end of the boom, um, sitting here on the pry, you know, and just with this whole fleet of boats behind me. And, you know, you always have a shot in mind before you go into these events and you think, this is sort of really what I want to try and capture. And then when you see it starting to unfold in front of you and the boat driver's listening to you, you can get in the place, in the spot without, you know, being in the wrong place for the sailors, but a good shot from my camera, then you can nail it. Here's our man on the leeward side trimming the sail and giving it a, just a little extra bit of grunt, you know. So I jumped in the water here and uh, I was touch, touch and go here with the police screaming at me, get out of the water, you're not supposed to be swimming and we're gonna report you. And I was like, oh man, I just have to take a chance here and just do it. And it just worked out so nicely because look at the color of the water. This isn't, you know, Atlantic dark green. This is beautiful you know, sort of tropical water. And again, this is with the Aquatech housing with a 14 millimeter lens in it. And I've done a lot of depth of field here at F-16. So now I'm off to Grenada, which is one of the islands in, this, in the Caribbean, which is close to Venezuela and Barbados. And here I mounted a 5D Mark IV um, in the masthead with a, with a fisheye 
the 15 millimeter fisheye and then using a remote control from a power boat, just clinging away. And I said to these kids, you guys do not capsize this boat because you'll just dawn on my camera, you know? I mean, and they're looking at me and I said, it's the, it's the value of a car. And then they said, oh shit, okay, Minia, no problem. You know, they didn't say Minia, of course. But that, that was, um, you know, a, a cool thing because I, I really couldn't see what I was shooting. I was just hoping, well, that's a good angle, click, 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 but it panned out. So here's the, you know, the sort of the prize giving and the boats finishing the race. And I jumped in the water and here's one of the kids who came right up to me and literally put his two fingers on the dome of the, of the aqua, Aquatech camera housing. And I thought, man, it just makes for a nice shot. I loved shooting there and, and working with that waterproof housing. And then when the boat capsizes, of course, the thing just about sinks and they got to get in the water and drop the, the mast and tow it back to the beach. And, and I would just jump in the water and swim around these guys and chat to them and, and click away of, you know, capturing the action. So um, here's a little film of, of how it happens and how they sail. And I, again, mounted a camera in the masthead and you'll get a little idea of, uh, this is pretty short. It's too, it's too high here. Okay. Back off, back off. Thank you. So um, I cut the audio. The audio just got so noisy. Um, and you can hear me, Quentin, right? Yeah, yes, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Um, so watch the guy at the back. He's just trying to, he's the late man. He's trying to get on the boat. He grabs him by the air. Go on. We must go now, you're late. Any case, these are the kids sailing, six of them, puffy, breezy, and of course, yeah, you know, not, not everything always goes as smoothly, but um, you'll see the boat starts to rock and roll here, and they're all to the one side, and then watch the guy in the front or on the left-hand side. Watch this guy here. He's like, he's going to bail out because he's like, shit, sinking, out of there. Um, then the boat capsizes, and then the ca camera captures everything beautifully. So um, just a, a nice scene of what actually happens when there's too much wind and the thing goes over. I'm um, assuming this had a, a housing around it, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it just captures it, captures it all beautifully. It's nice to have all these various different tools to work with. This is the, the Volvo race that came to Newport a few years ago, and these are also the same guys that came to Cape Town for the stop over there. And it's a big scene when they come here. We have these seven boats racing around the bay for their they're in the in the bay series and i get a, a a you know a flag a press flag for my boat and if i can get my young boy to drive who's 20 years old that's my best driver because he's a dinghy sailor and he understands what his old man wants and i just love working with him so this is the the volvo boats in in newport little aerial work of some of the 12 meters again here timing is everything with a 300 millimeter lens um, and talking to the pilot and circling around and making sure I don't upset the sailors with the noise of the, the heli, but still getting my picture. And then it's not all about crazy whacked out action here again on my, my motorboat, a 25 foot rib uh, or a duck, as you guys call them, um, to lured and looking up and really positioning the boat in the perfect place because I could go forward a little bit and then this boat would be covered or I could drop back in this one. And I really wanted to sort of get this guy in the middle of the shot and get the little boat on this side, you know, just framing the whole shot. And this was taken with a, a 24 to 70, something like that, that 2.8 that Canon makes. A, a bit of a longer shot and and I've been shooting a lot now with a 200 to 400 that, that has the 1.4 times converter built in and so a um, a very versatile lens for what I want to do because I'm on the short end it's 200 millimeters and then I can go to 400 and then engage the converter and then I get to 560 so wonderful for sailboat racing and again here notice how I've put sort of most of my guys low in the shot and then keep the sails up high and give it a nice balance. So here I'm concentrating on these guys working on the foredeck and, and later on when I was in post-production, I didn't even realize that here's a guy making another whole commitment in his life and wedding going on, on on the side as this boat was sailing in. So fun, fun you, shot there. You can claim to be a wedding photographer as well now. Yeah, <laughs> my one claim to fame, exactly. Um, here we were testing the new 500 uh, F4 
uh, Canon said, why don't you take this out and give it a, give it a run? And I um, went out during the whirls of this particular regatta. And uh, as they were coming up to the top mark, clicked away. So of course, it's a nice, sharp shot, lots of action and color. So this gives you a little idea of my kit. So um, I use these big plastic totes. Uh, SKB makes these boxes. They're kind of like a Pelican box, but a little lighter and a little easier on the wallet. Um, so here I have a 200 to 400 is what I just told you about and has the built-in converter. Then my 70 to 200, and then I have a 24 to 70. So three different bodies, all five Ds. I sort of stopped shooting with a 1DX. I just found them to be too heavy and uh, I didn't need that fast frame rate that that thing offers certain people. I never shoot on continuous high. I'm always just individually clicking away. So this is a nice setup for on the water, and then I can just grab my stuff and never have to change lenses. I mean, it's, it's luxury to have three bodies, but it's really fairly important. Back to Florida, down to Key West on a windy, gnarly day and a bumpy day, and you know, when you shoot on the water from sort of 9.30 until three o'clock, a whole long day on these conditions, it's nice to get back and have a have a beer and relax and you know you've earned your keep for the day. Again, this is probably with a 300 or a 400 in that range. I love shooting with those long lenses and sort of work in the foreground a little bit. Also Key West, uh, an early morning start, probably 9.30, 10 o'clock. Uh, winter light because it's, it's January in Florida, so you still have a nice little bit of light. It's not too blown out yet, sort of, you know, which one gets in the middle of the day. So here's a guy that's a little overpowered. You can see he's sort of hanging on for dear life and he's probably thinking I should have joined the chess club and not the sailing club. But in any case, um, you know, this was again being in the right place at the right time uh, with the heli and sort of sliding down there quickly and, and getting the shot. This is probably with a 70 to 200. Um, I shoot a lot with that, uh, that lens up in the air, 70 to 200, and then maybe with a 300 or now with a 200 to 400. I saw in one of your uh, pictures that you've got um, that you're using the new um, RF uh, 7200. Yes, so um, I'm slowly but surely moving over towards mirrorless, uh, or as they say in the States here, mirrorless. <laughs> um, if I say it with my South African accent, they don't understand what I'm saying, so I must talk Americans. Um, but the mirrorless system is wonderful. It's lighter, it's smaller, it's sharper, it's better. Uh, and who knows that next body that's coming out, the R5, that's gonna be another jump ahead. But I've really enjoyed working with the mirrorless and it's just a whole new way of shooting. It's better technology and, you know, I mean, I can stand here and talk on my little peach crate, but um, I, I love it. Pulled back a little bit, you know, sort of nice colors. I, I don't do anything in Photoshop. I don't have Photoshop. I don't know how to use Photoshop. My workflow is photo mechanic, where I import everything and sort of renumber and rename the files and then edit and pull the ones that I want and then move them over into Lightroom and I tweak the raw files to, um, to get everything looking perfect. Um, I'm a huge proponent of using the, the uh, I'm saying the Instagram, the um, histogram, you know, and uh, the histogram is so important just to get your exposures right when you're up on the water or out in the field. And then once you put them on the computer, you know that everything um, works beautifully. Back in the water in Grenada, uh, close up, you know, these guys sailing right by me. Here shooting with a 16 to 35 from my power boat, nice and close as, as we are sort of tucked in on the leeward side of this boat. An overcast day that you would say normally, ah, is it worth going out? But I was teaching a photo workshop and uh, I thought, well, we're committed. We've got 15 students coming along. Let's make the best of it. And we ended up getting some very nice stuff. Luckily, it was windy and pretty gnarly. So that sort of added to the, the dramatic light of the day. Um, the guy on the, on the back here, who is Sean McNeil, is a good mate of mine. Um, I, I always think he's waving to say good, what, goodbye, but he's obviously saying, get the hell out of the way. Then I always say to my driver, don't listen to him, ignore him. And if we don't get waved at at least two or three times a day, we're not doing our job properly. Into the shop with that 11 to 24, that Canon super wide angle zoom. And I just laid the camera down here, right on the deck where this guy was working and then obviously cropped the shot in post, but just to show a little bit of craftsmanship. And um, I had been assigned to shoot an old boat from 1886. 
same year they found gold on the Witwatersrand. I always think, man, that's an old boat. And it's the, uh, it's the oldest original privately owned boat still in one piece in the United States. So what they ended up doing was rebuilding the boat completely. And these are all the frames. And um, then if you look here, here the guys are. And actually this guy here, Eric Thiessen, is a boy from Neisner who uh, the Americans imported and said, come, you must come and fix our boat. And he's been working on this boat for years. But uh, again, just a, a nice perspective to show what they're doing. Look at these huge, big timbers, all made out of oak. Same sort of idea, you get how big she is. She's probably about 35 or 40 meters. So a massive old boat, a big restoration project. And because it's being done in Newport, I go down there every few months and just shoot how they're doing. Back on the water in Antigua, uh, with a long lens here with a 500. And uh, nice, look at, the, look at the shallow depth of field here. I just wanted to really concentrate on him on the bow and then the wave in the foreground's blown out. And it's so nice how the sun makes these little you know, the, uh, these little squiggles. And then the boat in the background was um, rising up on a wave and also out of, out of focus. That's fantastic. I love that shot. Thank you. Um, same idea, same regatta, uh, blowing. It's blowing here 25 to 30 knots. And these guys are just got a reef in. And as you wait for the swell to come between you and the boat, click, click, click. And uh, just love this foreground water. And then the guy's just visible over the wave. Off to San Francisco. And this was a challenge, man, shooting this stuff, because these things are doing about 40 knots, which is probably about 55 or 60 kilometers an hour. And uh, I'd be on my knees on the chase boat doing, you know, this, these ridiculous speeds with a 70 to 200 at a shutter speed of 2,000 to just try and freeze the action, you know. But it sure was cool stuff, fun to shoot. This is down at St. Bart's in the Caribbean where they have the, uh, the, the Caribbean, it's called the Bucket. And these millionaires get together and there's just a traffic jam of Learjets at the airport because these guys come in in their private planes. And, you know, if your boat ain't 35 meters, you can't join in because it's too small. Um, so um, interesting shooting. And this is a, an angle of a shot that you just hope to hell that the outboard doesn't crap out on the dinghy, you know, because then it's cock and batal, you know. So any case. And this guy ran up to me at the, at, in the evening afterwards and said, you want to come fly tomorrow? I've got a helicopter for half an hour. And I said, sure thing. So this was um, just one of the shots we got the next day. And, you know, who makes sails that are purple? But it sure adds to the picture. Yeah, um, a shot that, 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 that gets favorite, a lot of attention. Shot of mine. Love this. Love it. Yeah, thank you. Um, the camera's on the rail. Absolutely put down on the rail. And I use a little, it's called the pod. A POD, it's a little uh, beanbag type thing, small, only about six inches by two inches. Sorry, I have to talk American inches here. Um, I don't talk centimeters. And so I plonk it down here with a shutter speed of about a second or a second and a half and just click, click, click and shooting at F11 or F16 and lots of depth of field and you get a nice bit of movement. So um, everybody always thinks it's some secret science to getting a picture like this, but it's just leave the shutter open and make sure the camera stands pretty still. You know, you can get it. Another aerial shot of a 140 footer over in Antigua on a nice breezy day. Look at the action here in the back of the boat. These guys are holding on. It's not to get washed away in the same here. But from the helicopter, I'm nice and dry and comfortable. Same fleet, same race, back on the water, bumpy, and holding the 500. On board. Uh, I had the camera in a waterproof bag here with a flash inside the bag. So you can see I'm using flash. You can just see a little, but that sort of lights him up nicely. Otherwise his face is too dark and it's one hand for the boat and one hand for the camera, because if you don't hold on here, you will literally get washed off the boat and you'll be swimming. So I'm going to show you a little film here of what I did of this fleet. And this is the first time that these guys sailed together, five of these 140 footers since 1935. I was fortunate enough to be asked to, to film the whole occasion. I don't think I'm going to show you the whole film, but we'll just get a little taste of what it was like and what these massive boats are all about. They sail them with 30 crew. An average owner spends about $500,000 to do a regatta like this for four or five days. It's definitely the rich and famous that do this stuff.
name's Ken Reed. I'm from New Forward Island. So I have the wonderful opportunity to sail on board a J-Class boat, Henneman. Here at the St. Bart's Bucket. To be honest, it's about as different a type of boat as, as uh, anything I've sailed over the last five or six years because most of this crew just got done doing the Bob motion piece. And we're sailing amongst five incredibly competitive top-of-the-line programs, and it's going to be a heck of a weekend. I think I'm going to cut it short here. It's the 1930s. It's a great spectacle. Just to have five boats on the line of this caliber with this kind of crew and preparation, it's unprecedented. It's great. I'll cut out of there because I don't want to take up too much time on my films here. But here is, um, I went off to Rio to shoot the Olympics. Uh, the last time for the sailing for the U.S. Olympic team, and um, what a what a great experience to be shooting down there again with my 200 to 400 set at 400 and uh, nice shallow depth of field. Um, of course, the iconic shot of Rio with the lasers in the foreground and Christ the Redeemer up on the mountain. Ah, Kaptu. Here we are uh, in at the Langaban Lagoon, uh, and we were staying in one of the fishermen's cottages in Church Haven, and this is a a picture that my sister Mariette Greger, who lives in Hermon uh, near the Cape, in the Cape, um, took of us an early morning shoot. And um, just to show you my little kit bag, I love the 100 to 400. Um, what a nice lens that is. And then my 24 to 70 and uh, 16 to 35 and a 5D Mark IV in a small little think tank bag. Um, just very nice with a side access to the lenses. And that's what I really use uh, when I go walk about. Late in the afternoon, um, it's about six o'clock, just 20 minutes, half an hour before sunset. Again, with a 16 to 35 at probably F11, uh, handheld. I just loved the whole geometry of the shot, and I was lucky it was nice sky and nice low tide, so the sand bank was showing. Just a, a good spot to shoot. This was the next morning, again, low tide. Uh, I'm fortunate with that. Handheld, this is one of the Lighthouses where I live, this is about a five minute drive and handheld with ISO at about 5,000 just to sort of see what I could do here. This was a new camera I was testing. And then I went off to the Bahamas with my boys and uh, this is a little bit of a, uh, a story about getting there and you know, we chartered, we, well, we were given this, this little red boat and the three of us, this is my youngest boy, this is um, my middle boy, and this is uh, Luke Greger, who uh, studied at UCT and who is from Cape Town, now living in Switzerland. Um, and we just spent some time on this boat, exploring the Bahamas, poking around, and a very simple, basic little boat. Um, this was the shower, <laughs> where you could sort of wash your hair and do your thing. And... Um, you know, this was dinner, and of course, you know, he's burning the bloody sausages, and he's thinking, yeah, here we go again, black charcoal sausages. But in any case, it was a hell of an experience for these guys. Uh, this is with a 3028. They had these iguanas there on the beach, which was just fun stuff to photograph. And of course, the sugar birds were looking for something to eat. So young Adrian here, or as we call him, Yap, was uh, in the middle of the action. We found an old drug plane that had crashed there in the, in the 70s, and we were snorkeling doing our James Bond thing. It was just a wonderful time to go sailing with the boys. And, um, you know, the girls said, ah, we'll stay behind. We like an ice maker and a proper toilet, not a bucket and a proper hot and cold shower. And we said, see ya. And we took 10 days and explored the Bahamas. It was amazing. The guys would come alongside and bring us fish in the morning. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good time. Here we are down in the Grenadines. Uh, this is sort of near Barbados in the Caribbean, where I was working for a charter company and snorkeling and diving with the turtles and the crew. Again, our vendor comes in the morning as his fresh fish. Well, we know what was for dinner that, that night, something on the braai. He'd fillet them for us and we'd cook them up. Then I did a bunch of exploration work. This is down in the island of South Georgia, which is down at 55 degrees south, um, not far from Antarctica, where I would join a boat for sort of weeks on end, being their, their filmmaker and, and photography expedition guy. Um, sailing along, driving the bus was fun. It reminded me of my Whitbread around the world race days with obviously a huge tabular iceberg in the background. Um, this is the same type of thing in Patagonia where I would join a boat like this for a month and go and shoot for these guys. Off to um, Kamchatka, which is in Russia, uh, again with the Aquatac housing and tons of salmon. And here's a shot that the guy actually caught the fish and I was, it, 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 
in my waders knee deep and had the fish come by me a couple of times and click, click, click with my uh, 14 millimeter lens in the housing. This is up in Spitsbergen, which is uh, the Arctic north of Norway. Here I am up at the top of the mast of a 90 foot sailboat and directing the boat front with a radio to get the right angle and just to slowly nudge in towards the iceberg. And this ended up being, you know, the catalog cover of the Patagonia Clothing Company and various sailing magazines. So a well worthwhile type thing to do. Uh, this was shot with a 14 millimeter lens with a 5D. This is also up in the Arctic, just beautiful cruising up there. Just love it. Back down to South Georgia again, near Antarctica. This is such a gnarly day, blowing like stink. And the front had just gone through. We had an albatross flying around in front of the front of this iceberg. And I could only shoot downwind. I couldn't shoot upwind. There was just too much spray on deck. And then hundreds of thousands of these penguins. You know, and I always say, people always say, wow, what a beautiful scene. I said, yeah, but what's missing is the smell and the, and the noise, you know, and that would have sort of made the whole thing. <laughs> And when you wait long enough, you get these killer little keeper shots of a mom with her little chick. <clears throat> and we were fortunate enough to spend five weeks on the island of South Georgia. And my, my number one job was to document what we were doing there for the owner. It was wonderful. We had two little ducks and two dinghies. So we could always, you know, I could always say, oh, just move in a little bit. I had a radio and they had a radio and I could sort of put them reasonably close to the iceberg and give it some perspective. Obviously you don't want to get too close because these things end up rolling over and breaking apart regularly. <clears throat> we did a lot of hiking here and my pack was probably about, you know, 15 kilos. So uh, pretty heavy and I lost a lot of weight. It was good exercise and loved being out there. So this is the island of South Georgia at 55 degrees south latitude. You hang around long enough and you sort of watch these penguins on and off the iceberg. But they're all sort of, this guy's watching, should I go in now? And there was a leopard seal cruising around here waiting for lunch. So he was smart to wait and not go in. <clears throat> this is a young um, black-browed albatross, which was sitting on a nest. And I always carried my 300 8 with me in my bag, because especially to be able to photograph the, the birds, I don't want to get too close because you upset them. But this guy was waiting for mom to come back with, uh, with food. So um, nice to shoot this with a shallow F4 you know, and just blow out the background, but keep the bird tack sharp. And the leopard seals. Oh no, these are not leopard seals. These are, um, oh goodness, now I forget the name of this critter, but it's, it's, it's a um, sea lion. No, seal, what is it? You know what I'm talking about. This was the best part of being down there, these large wandering albatross, being able to photograph these guys in their ritual of mating the mating dance and this guy obviously liked this bulky and he was all in on meeting her and talking and eventually the wing <clears throat> was touching my lens <clears throat> i was using a, a 24 to 70 and uh, he got so close but he didn't care i was there because he just had something else in mind so this is a view from um, the roof of my gallery looking down into newport and it gives you a little idea of what the scenery is like here. So it's a big harbor uh, with tons of sailboats. There's very little commercial activity here, some fishing boats, but um, this is the scene in the winter of the same place. Um, we don't get this much ice very often, but when you do, it's absolutely cock and batal, and it really gets cold and it's pretty nasty. But I decided to grab a helicopter and go and fly around and uh, just capture the whole scene of the ice here in New England in February. And you again get an idea of what it's like with these big ice flows. And it's so cool how this whole ice field gets broken up as the tide moves in and out and the piers of the bridge just break up the ice completely. So besides being an assignment photographer, I have a gallery and this is sort of like compared to the waterfront in Cape Town, this is downtown Newport and this is bustling with people in the summertime. And we have a second floor, um, you know, gallery. And uh, it's, a, it's a good setup. My wife runs it. She started it 20 years ago and said, you know, your work is in the magazines and in the commercial work, but let's do a gallery and show people what you can do and that they can buy your work and hang it on the wall. And it's been a, a wonderful place to, to show my work. I've even got 
art directors who come in from New York who are on holiday and they come and walk around and they suddenly say, where's the photographer? Can I meet him? And then we start talking about assignment work and I've got many assignments through my big, shall we say, portfolio that's hanging on the wall here. Uh, working with Canon, we have access to the best printers in the business and the best inks and paper. And here you can see uh, some of the work coming out of the printer. I do workshops. I charter a 50 foot old uh, lobster boat and we take up to 15 photographers out on the bay, uh, sometimes for racing, sometimes for just an afternoon shoot. We start, four to, uh, we start at four o'clock and we finish off at about eight. And uh, I walk around and help these people, you know, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, whatever, whatever they want to know. Some people are really dialed in and others are beginners. And it's a wonderful way to learn to shoot. And this is also a shot taken during my workshop of all the students, you know, from the bow of the boat shooting some of the sailing going on. This is my rig for video work. So this is the XF305 with a gyro underneath it. So it's an XY gyro. And then I use this easy rig, which then enables me to sort of hang on to this rig and not have to hold it because it's heavy. I mean, it's probably 10 kilos at least, maybe 15. So after 10 minutes of hand holding it, you're tired. But with this, this has an adjustable, you know, spring in it. So it sort of balances the weight of the video beautifully. Um, I was assigned to, to document the build of this 100 foot boat called Comanche. And it was just an incredible assignment from the build all the way to the first sale. So um, I'm going to show you this little film here. And this is what I, what I did and, and filming and still photography of Comanche, an amazing project. The first time I, I saw Comanche's hull, I remember kind of peering over the apron down into this shed. I remember looking down and just going, oh my God. Uh, it's massive. This is part of the aircraft carrier. My name is Ken Reed. I'm the skipper of the boat. My job is to hire all the best guys I possibly can and create something like this. Jim Clark had been talking about this for a while. He got caught up in it and he, it was all of a sudden all of his buddies were egging him on to build a hundred footer and he obliged. His operation has to fulfill his very competitive ambitions. And, and trust me, he is as competitive uh, as any person I've ever been around in my entire life, as is his wife, Kristen, by the way. The two of them combined. There's no messing around. If you do it, you do it right. The build team that we assembled and who really ran the build up at Hudson are the best of the best. The shapes and sizes and tolerances that these <coughs> builders are building to now. It's nothing shy of unbelievable. Tim Hodgson and the whole Hodgson team, they lengthened buildings, they built ovens, they bought on buildings. They wanted to look not just at this project, but they wanted to look at carbon fiber manufacturing well into the future. The back of the boat is 25 feet wide. It's just stability, purely stability. The more stability you get from the hull form, the less you have to do as far as weight in the keel, so lighter boat. Secondly is mass placement. Design services at North Sales, they started running drive force coefficient. So the mass would start, let's say, just 4 to 50%, which is way up here. And then he put it back a meter, and he came back to us, and to paraphrase, it's better. Put it back a meter, it's better. Put it back a meter, it's better. In essence, he kept going until it started getting slower. This is more of a traditional multi-hull position than it is a mono-hull position. Every sail here is carbon fiber. Everything you see above the deck is carbon fiber. It's what carbon fiber allows you to do, and it's nothing shy of spectacular. The adrenaline rush is there's nothing like it. You know, goggles on, blasted with water, guys holding on. You down below, and it's like Armageddon. The slamming and the sounds down below it, it is a completely different animal. It's far more like a race car 
than you would ever imagine. It's literally at high speeds, two fingers, and a tiny little movement, and you can really make the focus fine. What this thing can do in front of eyeballs on Sydney Harbor with the unboxing day. That tells a story that lasts forever, and hopefully that attracts more people to our sport. An amazing boat. Um, that concludes my presentation. I still have four minutes left. I think I've done all right, Quentin. Jamming it all into an almost hour. I think um, you've done fantastically. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it was a lot of material. I hope you guys um, sort of get the drift of what I'm trying to do and what I'm doing. I've been doing it for 34 years. Um, it's a long time. I'm an old fart, um, but I still love it. I'm still happy to jump on a chase boat, get on a heli and go and photograph sailboats and you know being a sailor originally from cape town or hot bay and um having that in my back pocket and then going to shoot sailing commercially either stills or video has made a huge a difference in and giving me a little leg up on the competition because then you, as you can imagine in the united states there's a lot of competition here and you've got to get yourself to the top uh to sort of get the assignments and work with canon and, and do the work so Again, thanks for watching. Please email me. You can see my website, fundarval.com. Um, go to the website, send me an email, give me a shout. I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, let's keep in touch. And Quinton, again, thank you so much for having me on. This has been awesome. Uh, and it was an absolute pleasure having you. Uh, you know, uh, one of uh, you know certainly my superheroes uh, when it comes to photography. Uh, it's been fantastic having you uh, with us. Um, I, I think we've probably got about uh, two and a half minutes left. Um, and, and so I'm going to say, awesome. Thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> thank you. It's it. Um, but I do have a question, which I'm hoping you can answer from uh, Michael Lewis. Um, he says, um, uh, he wants to know if you recommend that photographers slowly build up a library of personal work that can be used in later part of their careers to sell as art prints as you have done with your gallery uh, that you and your wife run? Yes, I think that, you know, now that I'm, I'm 64 years old and there's times when I just love to take it easy, go to the beach, go and swim, go and fish and not have to feel that I have to go and take pictures all the time. My archive of artwork is now feeding us and hanging on the walls in the gallery. And during this time with this crazy virus, the only thing that is selling, not as fast as normal, but we are selling work and it's stuff on the gallery and we've got a good web presence. So you keep shooting your own artwork and oh yeah, absolutely don't as, as, do as much as you can. I'm, I'm doing workshops, I'm doing artwork, I'm doing filming, I'm doing all kinds of different stuff, lecturing. So uh, keep shooting your own personal work. Good, good, good point there. Thank you. And I think it, it, it just uh, reinforces the, um, the point that I, I, I think I might have made yesterday or the day before about um, copyright and owning your work. You know, yes. if, you, if you don't own your work, you're not going to be able to use it later on for, you know, licensing to uh, whoever that might be, you know. Um, when those yep. art directors come to you and say, can I use this for a, for a shoot? Uh, you go, oh, sorry, no, it's owned by someone else. It's very important right. if you want to use that and, and, and have additional revenue streams, you've got to own the work. I have done very well with stock photography over the years. And, you know, the, the, the Brits always wanted me to shoot for them. The British magazines, Yachting World and so on. And they said, well, it's work for hire. We own the images. And I said, no, thanks. And I've never, ever done one single assignment. And they've called me up dozens of times. Whereas in the US, the magazines get first time North American rights and then the copyright returns to me. And I have done very, very well on making sure I own the rights to the images and have releases that's really important to get the releases when you're on location, get somebody to make a quick little scribble on a piece of paper and then you own it and you can sell it. Absolutely. Well, I think we're almost done there. Um, on it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been fantastic to have you on and um, yeah, I'll, I'll continue to follow your amazing work. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on and good luck with your lockdown. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.